The Tom Woods Show, episode 1915. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here, joined once again by our old friend, Marco Bassani, who is a professor at the University of Milan and author of the brand new book, Chaining Down Leviathan, The American Dream of Self-Government, 1776 to 1865. This is history as Thomas Jefferson himself would have written it. And I think you will find great intellectual pleasure in it. And you will also find yourself liberated as from shackles. That is to say, ideas that were drilled into your head as a kid are just going to fly away as you read this book and come face to face with the actual history of the United States rather than the cartoon version. We're going to devote this episode to a discussion of the material in Marco's book specifically on the Philadelphia Convention of 1787 and the years slightly before and perhaps slightly after that period. Marco, welcome back. Thanks a lot, Tom. Well, listen, I want to dig into more of your book now and we'll get into the American history portion. I've just this week had our friend Brian McClanahan on for several days. And so it's like a Jeffersonian week because of the the two of you. Oh, yeah. So we're going to talk today about Federalists and Anti-Federalists, what you call the original American debate. Now, this chapter of your book includes some discussion of the evolving understanding of the concept of sovereignty in the minds of the American colonists and a contrasting of their evolving view with the, I don't know, maybe what we might call the traditional British view, the way the British viewed their empire. Obviously, the colonists looked at the locus of sovereignty differently from the British themselves. So how should we understand this? Well, this is actually what was called um, somehow the reconstruction of uh, the empire was made in a, in a sort of a federal way by the American colonists and made not, it was a totally ideological thing, right? For the British, it was not a fair description of how the empire worked. Also, all these ideas about taxation and representation uh, were, were totally far-fetched. Benjamin Franklin was in England um, in the 70s, and uh, so they said, uh, what are you talking about? What are you colonists talking about? You know, we, we, it's not so linked. You know, taxation is not really linked to representation. So, you know, take off. But, you know, Americans took it very seriously, the whole thing, taxation. And also the idea was that the crown was somehow the arbiter of different political communities. So Westminster was the parliament of the of England, but not for the Americans. The Americans had their own colonial parliaments, the only ones that could actually tax them and uh, could um, draw legislation for them. So this was the very ideological, it could be called uh, like um, the empire construed as a federation of different uh, communities, but didn't work that way. But it was very important for what we could call the, the colonial revolutionary fracture. Is there a way that we can figure out, not according to our own personal preferences, but according to the facts and according to the traditional understanding, who's right in this dispute? Are the colonists in the right or are they spinning some new novel understanding just for their own sake? Well, it was, it was a, an ideological twist. Uh, Bernard Bailyn in the 1960s wrote a wonderful book about the ideological origins of the American Revolution. So w- when you talk about ideology, I don't think there's there's any way to reconstruct, to see where true and false, right? It was uh, based on the American experience of self-government as colonists. It was based on their general ideas about government. It was based on a radical reading of John Locke, who was uh, certainly the most important political theorist for the colonists, for the revolutionary generation, at least. And then Montesquieu was very important in the, of course, during the constitutional period and so on. So actually, when you're talking about ideology, I don't think there is any way to say who was right. Clearly, there was um a revolutionary fracture that happened on the locus of sovereignty, on the idea of federalism itself. So the Americans actually thought that they were 
living in free states at them, only the assemblies, their own assemblies in Virginia, the House of Burgesses in Virginia and other assemblies could actually tax them. And the British could not understand that at all. You see that there was um, when Edmund Burke had his very famous speech on conciliation with the colonies, there were like six or seven people in Westminster. They didn't want to hear about that. So clearly there was a clash between two totally different visions of self-government, political community. I would say federalism. It was proto-federalism or something of that sort. I remember reading a book when I was in graduate school by Jack Green called Peripheries and Center, where he was reckoning with these issues of the empire and the colonies and what the relationship between them was. And given that there's no written British constitution, there are some documents, but there's no constitution per se. Well, there's it's traditional. Written. I beg your pardon? I, I, it is written. I mean, it's not in one single document. but It's not course, in one single yeah, document, right. but traditional practice weighed heavily on determining sure, sure. the constitutionality of something. And so if the colonies had enjoyed a century and a half of more or less uninterrupted self-government, doesn't that itself become part of the tradition by which we determine what is constitutional or not? I think that was the way the colonists looked at it. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting thing. You know, there, is, there are two schools of thought. I think they're both right and both wrong, right? The first school is the Americans were fighting for the rights of the Englishmen. They wanted to be treated like British subjects. And uh, so they were claiming they were not appealing to the laws of nature and natural rights. And actually, they wanted to be treated like British subjects at home. And there's uh, so this is like uh, the meaning of the American Revolution is we're not treated rightly. So we want to be left alone because we're British and we want self-government. And we believe that every subject of the empire needs self-government, every single political community. Now, the other idea is actually there was a radicalization of the American Revolution based on the theory of natural rights. They're both <laughs> there. You, know, you cannot, it's just Thomas Jefferson against John Adams. You know, the, the, the two for every Adams in American history, there's a Jefferson, more radical natural right theorist. So clearly there was uh, this interpretation of the American Revolution as a Sort, sort of conservative revolution was there from the beginning. There was a German one, actually, that made it popular. His name was Gens in 18-something, right at the beginning. Oh, that's, yeah. He, didn't he write that comparison between the American and French revolutions? Yeah. The American, that, that was like the first, and then it became a theme, a classical theme. The American Revolution and um, and the French Revolution compared and uh, they were, they were how different they were and all these kind of things, which is kind of true, of course, but uh, there are certain things that uh, cannot be overlooked, which is the very importance of the natural rights tradition for uh, early Americans, for the colonies. You know, there's a whole discussion in the first Congress, and it goes on for two or three days. And it is so clear that everybody, every single one of them knew the second treatise of government and has read the second treatise of the government of John Locke, who's like the foundation of this idea of natural rights and natural law. So this is um this was clearly part and parcel of the American ideology for the 1776 and on. Well, let's move into when Americans now are no longer arguing with the British, but arguing among themselves. So now we move into the Philadelphia Convention after the Confederation period. There's a consensus that's developed about the inadequacy of the Articles of Confederation. Now, that itself is an interesting topic. Is to there? Get into. Yeah, my point would be, would, is there a consensus? Not so sure. Historians are divided. You know, some people say that uh, a lot of, you know, Americans were doing pretty good under the Articles of Confederation. It was kind of... Um, I agree with you. I definitely agree with you on that. But I, 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 and now was there, that's a legitimate question. I, I, I guess I, I know where you're coming from on this, but even somebody like Thomas Jefferson, who had profound decentralist sympathies, he still favored the constitution. 
Well, not really, actually. He didn't like it at all at the beginning. You know, as soon as he took a look at the Constitution that was sent, the project of the Constitution, it just uh, commanded on it in uh, already uh, the September or October 1787 when he was in Paris. And he says, well, he, he just said, what is this precedent? It is just a... Uh, it just um, looks like um, uh, a Polish king, you know, that uh, just an elected king. What is this? You know, so he criticizes a lot the Constitution before he came back home, of course. At that point, the Constitution was already there, right? So it was it had been ratified by the state. So it didn't talk too much against the Constitution. But there are other articles and letters in 1795 96, when he says, well, probably the anti-federalists were the real Republicans, not the federalists. So Thomas Jefferson had reservations, a lot of reservations about the Constitution. Right, and I agree with him about the anti-federalists, but he was not urging people not to ratify. No, he was uh, He was uh, very, he didn't want to be drawn into a conflict in which he was not present in the country, right? He was um, he was in France, ambassador in France. There's even the movie. So he didn't want to be drawn there, but uh, clearly he voiced his um, criticism on of uh, the Constitution to James Madison and uh, other people he was corresponding with. So he, he was not, no, definitely my... You know, I think it could be said that he was not. He was he was not an anti-federalist. He writes this very famous letter saying, I'm not a federalist, I'm not an anti-federalist, because he considered them two political parties. At that point, he just believed that political parties were, we didn't need political parties, right? So at that point, that is 17, 1789, 19. But he didn't want to be dragged into a conflict that he didn't know anything about. That was um, this anti-federalist, federalist debate. There's a famous book called What the Anti-Federalists Were For. And that's a tricky thing because with the, the Federalists, the people who favored the Constitution, I can very easily describe to you what they were for. But I think the Anti-Federalists were more diverse in their points of view. They agreed in their assessment of the Constitution, but sometimes for different reasons. So how do you put together a coherent statement of beliefs, more or less, emerging from the Anti-Federalists? You're right. This is um, this is a little bit of a problem. First of all, they never. They can, if you take a look at what what was the the collection that came out about 40 years ago, and uh, it was the the so-called complete anti-federalist. We're not complete, but we're talking about six or seven volumes. So they do not have a single volume like the Federalists. And so the first thing is they didn't want to ratify the Constitution. This is what kept them together. They were against the ratification of the Constitution. Why were they against it? For one single reason, that was the most important. That was, it was concentration of power, right? So in this sense, I consider them the first champions of this great battle, American battle against the modern state. And on the other hand, actually, the real champions of the modern state were the Federalists, and especially Alexander Hamilton. And this is, so the first thing is they were not in favor of ratifying the Constitution because it was too centralized. And um, and they do, they were, in a certain sense, also radical Democrats. You know, there's one one of them says, well, you see the, the districts, they will have like more than 30,000 people. And... Uh, so it, it would be impossible to for one single person to represent them all. Think about uh, what is it nowadays? Seven hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand. Right? Go write your congressman or congresswoman yeah. or congress. He represents you. Yeah, he represents you. Just write to him. And so he, they were, in a certain sense, th th there's a very famous article, "Man of Little Faith." It was written by. Uh, great scholar in the 1950s, but the idea was that they had no faith in democracy. It, it was quite the opposite. You see, the anti-federalists really thought that democracy was possible on a small scale, like uh, exactly like what Montesquieu said, what the Swiss thought, Swiss canton, American state, maybe even uh, American counties and so on, but uh, 
not on a large scale. You know, they were against, I would say that they were actually against the extended republic that is the focus of Federalist Number 10 by James Madison. And it's the idea of the empire. To them, it was clear, either empire or liberty. And uh, in this sense, he was uh, the very eloquent one was um, this guy, um, Patrick Henry, right? Very famous for give me liberty or give me death. But he writes, his speeches at the Virginia ratifying convention are really very compelling in terms of uh, liberty and the idea that he was, some people said he should just hate an empire as a state of life, right? As a, as a way of life. So this, um, this um, Patrick Henry uh, really said, believe that Americans had to behave pretty much like the Swiss, right? He loved the Swiss. Um, well, there was no Switzerland in those days, but clearly there were the cantons, right? So then he perceived them as peaceful and uh, not in look of uh, glory and a big government and uh, to impose uh, the will, their will on other peoples. Hey, folks, let's take a quick minute to thank our sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare would have seemed like something out of science fiction just 30 years ago. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, entrepreneurship, and more. These classes tend to be nice and short and to the point. They combine video lessons with a class project. They have classes to fit your schedule and skill level. And one membership gets you access to every single one of them. For the sake of one of my daughters, who's very creative and has numerous interests and she's good at all of them, I recently took Martina Flores' class, Be Your Own Boss, Strategies for Launching Your Creative Career, to find some golden nuggets to help her out if she should ever want to launch a creative career. Super affordable, high quality, and immensely satisfying. Well, explore your creativity at Skillshare.com woods and get a free trial of premium membership. That's a free trial of premium membership at Skillshare.com slash Woods. You know, I'm thinking about what I said before about the anti-federalists being diverse and the federalists being more homogeneous in their views, but but now I'm rethinking that in light of what you just said, uh, reminding me about the ratification in, in Richmond, because there you had a lot of, you had federalists assuring people of principles that today we would consider probably anti-federalist. So Edmund Randolph was a federalist. And he and others were saying the federal government will have only the powers expressly delegated to it and that uh, if it should reach for any power not delegated, then in that case, Virginia would be exonerated from uh, having to enforce such a measure. And so there you know, clearly is indicated uh, the idea of nullification. And that's coming not from the anti-federalists, but from the federalists of Virginia. Now, I don't think the federalists of New York talked that way. And certainly Alexander Hamilton was extreme even for the Federalists. So maybe there is more uh, diversity than I'm giving them credit for. No, you're, you're perfectly right. Actually, this is um, – the idea is uh, for, of the Federalists, uh, was, um, of the Anti-Federalists actually, was when came up in the ratification of the Virginia for the Constitution in 1788, right? So the Federalists won finally by a small margin and so on, but – they made it very clear. They said, we, the delegates of the people of Virginia, do declare and make known the powers granted under the, under the Constitution being derived from the people of the United States may be resumed by them whensoever the same shall be perverted to their injury or oppression. So that they made it clear, right? We're ratifying this experiment in self-government. If it doesn't work, we'll get our power back. And uh, and that was agreed upon by everyone, Federalist, anti-Federalist. And um, so in this in this sense, it was uh, very clear that it was a little an experiment, but the real important thing was freedom, not the union. The union for all of, almost all of them was just an artifact, something made, made up by the colonists, but in order to preserve self-government. And that's why the whole 60, first 60, 70 years of the Constitution was a long constitutional debate on the interpretation of the Constitution. The whole thing. You see, there is, let's say, before the first 50 years before independence, 
They talked about all sorts of political stuff, political communities. Are you organized them? Then after the Constitution passed, all Americans were talking about was how to interpret the Constitution. So clearly, it was a document that needed to be interpreted. Let me ask you this. The idea of sovereignty, if I had to define that, what it means for something to be a sovereign power, I would define it as a power that can act without requiring the permission of anyone else. So the United States government is sovereign because it doesn't need to consult the government of Canada or the United Nations or whatever. It can make its own decisions. A colony, by definition, is not sovereign. The colonizing power is the sovereign. So there were discussions of sovereignty, as we said, in the years leading up to and during the American War for Independence. Now you get to the Constitution, you have this collection of states, which according to Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, are free and independent states, and that they may do all the things that free and independent states may of right do. But then you have people like Alexander Hamilton who don't like the idea of independent states. So there's still not a consensus on the nature of sovereignty. Where is the locus of sovereignty in this new political arrangement? Is it in the state governments? Is it in the peoples of the states? Is it in the United States government? Is it in the people of the United States? Does the Constitution resolve this matter unambiguously? Not at all, actually, though. I would even go further and say that um, Americans had no idea on the concept of sovereignty itself, right? So it is not only the locus of sovereignty. Now, sovereignty is really an idea that cannot be traced back to the Middle Ages. It is a totally modern idea. The first, it was um, invented by Jean Baudin in 1576. So it's a cluster of ideas about modernity and politics. And it, of course, it means exactly what you said. There's no foreign interference. So you can say that Canada is a for, uh, sovereign country. So is uh, uh, Switzerland. So is the United States. But um, so it, it's, it's a pluralistic arrangement. Many states always, not a single one, right? And it means also supremacy. It means borders. When we talk about sovereignty, we understand that sovereignty is made as a territorial thing. So you have to think about borders of sovereignty. I'm sovereign in this area, right? And if you get a fine in a certain county, then you just move you move out of the state and maybe they're never going to get your fine. So there are clear borders. There's uh, this uh, very well-known story of Yuri Gagarin going into space and looking at the earth and say, I don't see any border, you know? And so the Soviets say, oh, it's so peaceful. You want peace and communism for all mankind. But actually, since we take a look, you know, every time we look at the map, we imagine borders, right? Borders are in our mind and they are part and parcel of sovereignty. So sovereign means you are supreme in relation to other authorities. You're independent and, um, Think about it. In 1945, there were 50 states, 50 sovereign states in the whole world, maybe less. Now there are almost or maybe a little bit more than 200. So this system of sovereign states that was um, that had occurred, it, it was part of European history. It started um, with a piece of uh, Westphalia in 1648 and so on. Now it's all over the world. It's an arrangement that works all over the world. So what, it, what does it mean to enforce laws, implement policies? But since the beginning, of course, there was um, the idea of the supremacy of federal laws, right? The federal laws that were made according, of course, with the Constitution. Otherwise, it doesn't... They're not, of course, they're not even federal laws for um, this uh, statewide school. So sovereign is really not a question of power, but of freedom from legal subordination to any other authority. It's like some people may remember what Truman said, uh, the buck stops here, right? This is, I will not pass responsibility to a higher authority. It is mine. You know, so this is like the supreme test of authority, but doesn't give us the idea of sovereignty. It's no solution for problems of power. There's no way of limiting power within the paradigm of sovereignty. So the sovereignty paradigm is, of course, it tells you a lot of things like uh, that you are 
the, the, the king is emperor inside his kingdom, right? But the theory of sovereignty is always predicated on a potentially limitless, limitless concentration of power. So this was the problem for American federalism. Well, the issue, it seems to me, is this. When they ratified the Constitution, there clearly appeared to be some acknowledgement that the sovereigns were the peoples of the states. That's why they had special conventions. They didn't ratify the Constitution in the state legislatures. They had it specifically in special conventions elected for that purpose because it was part of the political theory of that time that the, the special convention was the highest voice of the sovereign people. The question becomes, once the Constitution now is ratified, what then becomes of the, it seems to me sovereignty always is always sovereignty. The peoples of the states, if they acceded to the union, they can secede from the union. They still hold the sovereignty. They're not yielding their sovereignty. They're not giving it to anybody else. They're saying that this group of people can exercise certain powers on our behalf, but really for as long as we want them to, because we're the ones giving them the power. We're the ones who are the sovereigns. But I would think that an Alexander Hamilton looking at this, even though he does say in The Federalist that it would be mad for the federal government ever to use force on the states, in principle, I don't see how he can, in principle, be. it might be mad, but in principle, I don't see how he could oppose that. It seems to me this is the question. Once the Constitution is ratified, where's the sovereignty now? Yes, this is uh, this was the big question for 60, 70, 75 years. There's no doubt about that. But uh, for Alexander Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton says a lot of things in, in the Federalist um, and the Federalist, the articles that he wrote for the um, for the New York Gazette that uh, he didn't believe in. We know that for sure. I mean, he believed that the states had to be destroyed in order to form a centralized uh, Republic, right? That is why Thomas Jefferson called it, him a monarch, you know, a monarchist. Not because he wanted a king, but because he wanted to create a single center of power. So this, this is, to a lot of people, it was clear the supreme power of sovereignty was in the states. Uh, Thomas Jefferson makes it clear. He says, we are a nation for special purposes only. And uh, that was made uh, even more more clear by John Calhoun, who says uh, uh, we are an assemblage of nations. Right? So this is uh, clearly the idea that um, there's a, something like a oh, people of the United States that be before before um, Abraham Lincoln was not even considered a uh, fact possible. Right? This, the United States is called uh, the land. It's these United States. It's the numbers of well, them, you know, all the states together. But it's the idea that there is a single people of the United States that's part of the contract. The contract was compact of the Constitution was made by the states. And you're right. They had state conventions. So the ultimate sovereign of the United States and the Constitution is the supermajority that could destroy the Constitution altogether the supermajority of the states. Now, the first time that it was suggested that it was the people, not the governments of the states, of course, but only the, the people of those states, that every time you talk about the state, you talked about a people, was in the Virginia Report of 1800s, and it was hinted, not well, a bit more than hinted, by written by, uh, down by James Madison, who at that time became Jeffersonian. Right. There are two Madisons. One is the Hamiltonian Madison of 1787, 88. And then there's the Jeffersonian Madison of uh, later on. I wish I could remember the historian of Madison who tried to claim, I read his whole book and now I can't remember. He tried to claim that actually Madison was perfectly consistent through his whole career. Not, not that, an easy task, I would say. No, no, and I, doggone it, I cannot remember. I know Gutzman would know at the top yeah, of his no, head. Yeah, no, I mean, Gutzman is, um, yeah, and he, he believes that there is some consistency, but not totally consistent. No, 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 no. He clearly sees a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but he would know the, sure. the schmuck I'm thinking of who, I don't know, <laughs> why would you devote your life to something like this? It is. Uh, well, to, you know, to, uh, I mean, of, be a historian of Madison, but don't commit yourself to a guy who clearly said different things. Different <laughs> right. things. Like what, what he was saying in the uh, at the time of the 
nullification crisis is clearly at odds with what was totally going on in 1798. Completely at odds. You know, but but let's get to that. Nullification or, yeah, well, well, let's get to that in another episode because well, that really is some, we'll some juicy material. Uh, but for now, let's um, we're going to leave people hanging a little bit because what we're going to do is take what I think is a kind of ambiguity because I can certainly read the Constitution and I, I think the, the most plausible reading of, of it and of the history surrounding the ratification is the compact theory of Jefferson that does place the locus of sovereignty in the peoples of the states, which has radical implications for nullification and secession and stuff like that. But in the next episode, well, let's, we're going to look at the early republic. And now as the, the history of, of America now continues, we're going to see how maybe in the minds of some people this unresolved issue works itself out in actual practice. So we're going to be discussing all this stuff in your book next time. And of course that book is Chaining Down Leviathan, The American Dream of Self-Government 1776 to 1865, linked for purchase at tomwoods.com slash 1915. Marco, thanks very much. I look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Tom. All right, folks, before we get going, let me tell you something. A lot of people are terrible writers. Let's just face it. A lot of people are terrible writers. It takes a lot of practice to become a good writer. And I think that is the key to becoming a good writer. It's a combination of practice and reading people who are good writers. I actually did an episode on how to become a better writer. So if you go to tomwoods.com slash episodes and you do a search on page for the words better writer, you'll see that episode. I don't remember what number it is. But I'm convinced that those are the two things. Read people who are good at writing, you know are good. And then practice a lot. And as you practice... As you're writing all these pedestrian sentences, I want you to say to yourself, now, wait a minute, would H.L. Mencken have written this boring sentence? But on the other hand, you don't want your sentences, oh, it's it's worse for your sentences to be wordy with big words for their own sake because you think that makes you a good writer. Oh, my gosh, I'm begging you. So you want to just practice and read. That's going to make you better. Well, I preface what I'm about to say with this because I came across a listener website where the author clearly can write. It's actually a pleasure to read her writing. How about that? Her blog is called Red Bird Road, but the website is srochelle.com, S-R-O-C-H-E-L-L-E.com. And she says that the site was created as a way for her to collect ideas and stories. And because she's a libertarian, this also means she's interested in spreading our ideas. She says, I'm mostly self-educated, And I've realized through that process that books hold more educational potential than the college education I did not have. So I share books and authors that helped me to heal from the past and that shaped my worldview. My hope is to spark an interest in reading forgotten books and authors. The site's tagline is Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Meaning. She says, I write about life and people who inspire me. I write about freedom and soul healing. I write to find a why for living instead of only how. In books, I find hope. History connects me to those who have gone before. Their stories remind me of what beauty humans are capable of, even in an absurd world. And the beautiful language in old books enriches my modern mind. So I hope you will check it out. I'm going to link to the site at tomwoods.com slash 1915. And remember, it's S. Rochelle, S-R-O-C-H-E-L-L-E dot com. You can get publicity like this for a website you're thinking of creating by heading over to tomwoods.com slash publicity and getting your web hosting through my link. And then you get publicity from me along with several other bonuses that, again, don't cost you a cent that will really give you a nice head start out of the gate. I want my listeners to prosper, and so I'm going to use what tools I have to help bring that about. And if you would like to be a recipient of that, then check out the details at tomwoods.com slash publicity. More with Marco Bassani tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.